Okay. So, um, you know, uh, last time we kind of got through the first two transactions. Uh, today, we're going to get through um, a good bit of the accounting cycle. We're going to kind of end just before we get to adjusting entries. And so um, I'm going to try to keep the two classes kind of in sync as much as I can. So if we move more quickly, then we'll, we'll finish a little bit early. If we, if we move a little more slowly, um, I, I had a little buffer at the end of the class. So, so hopefully we should be good. Um, and just to kind of give you uh, a refresher of, of what we're doing, because I know at this point, it can feel like we're getting really caught up in the details and just sort of like debits and credits. And it can feel a little bit, um, I don't know, just kind of you know, just detailed. Um, but just remember what we're really trying to do is, is we have economic activities that a company is doing. And, and we're starting to map some of those or identify some of those economic activity, but there has to be a process in place to take these economic activities and present them to uh, external users of that information so that they can make good decisions. And so the system that we're learning is, is how we're creating that map, how we're mapping all that out, and how we're connecting all the dots. And so, you know, just please understand that while this is gonna feel a little bit like we're kind of really just slogging through, like this is the foundation of how we communicate the economics of a company. And so um, this is just a process that you need to understand and know. And, um, and hopefully though, you always have an eye towards you know, what the goal is. And so when you see something like this um, journal entry where we're paying $18,000 uh, advance for six months rent at a new office building, we're kind of thinking about what's economically going on here. You know, what, what accounts uh, are, are gonna show up and why is it those accounts? And, um, you know, it's, it's, yeah, sure we can memorize and I'm not saying that some of this isn't a little bit of memorization because I get that, um, but I think it's more than that. It's really kind of understanding what's going on. And so, um, you know, with each one of these transactions, I'm gonna try to explain in the conceptual framework of sort of why the accounts are what they are. But, but for now, let's kind of, Let's take this journal entry and, and, and let's figure out, you know, what are the debits, what are the credits, um, and then we'll kind of talk about why afterwards. So what do we have here in terms of debits and credits? What's the debit and what's the credit? Okay, it's early. All right, well, the debit is uh, prepaid rent and the credit is cash. Now let's think about the, the cash, hopefully it's not too difficult and that, you know, whenever you pay, uh, we're, we're decreasing that asset, cash is an asset, we're decreasing that asset for that payment. And so we're gonna credit cash. Again, uh, just with an asset, we assets decrease with credits and they increase with debits. And then the other half of the transaction is this prepaid rent. And prepaid rent is also an asset. Now let's think about why it's an asset. So, um, and so there needs to be a future economic benefit, a past transaction or event, and there needs to be present ownership or control. And so with prepaid rent, I mean, hopefully you recognize the future economic benefit is the use of the building. And so that's gonna, you know, the ability to work and have use of the building is an important economic benefit and then present ownership or control, you know, when I've paid rent, uh, much like if you pay rent at an apartment, I mean, you control the use of that space. I mean, not, not, uh, not without any sort of end to it, um, but, you know, obviously there's just a measure of control that you have. And then finally, of course, the past, past transaction or event is, you know, there is an economic transaction here, uh, cash has been paid. And so, um, and so it meets those criteria for an asset. And so, you know, with prepaid rent, the reason that it's a debit is because we are increasing that future economic benefit. You know, before we didn't have access to using a building, now we do. And so we're gonna increase the value of that asset and we increase assets with debits. And so, you know, that's kind of the thought behind the journal entry is that now I have this asset that's been created through this payment um, and then, of course, over time, I'm going to be using that building. And as we use up that benefit, that's when we're going to start recording the expense. You know, that discussion is going to come later. 
Um, but for now, uh, the fact that we now have access to using this building is a future economic benefit for this firm. And so that's why prepaid rent is an asset. Uh, does that make sense? Again, a lot of, a lot of detail, um, but uh, you know, um, I want us to move past just memorizing journal entries. And, and of course, again, there's an element to it, but um, I want us to be thinking about why these are the accounts. All right, the next one. Uh, purchase $20,000 of office equipment using cash, which it assumes will have a three-year useful life. So office equipment is being purchased using cash, and they assume that they're going to be able to use that office equipment for the next three years. So what's the debit and what's the credit? Okay, so credit to cash. Equipment is the debit. Give a few more minutes to, to chime in on that. Yep. And that's correct. So uh, again, the office equipment provides a, a future economic benefit because now I have desks and chairs and things like that to use uh, to do my job uh, that I didn't have before. And, and of course that, uh, you know, it's gonna be, we are gonna use up that equipment over the next however many years. Uh, but for now, we now have that future economic benefit. We, we control, uh, we actually own the equipment and it's ours to do with what with, do with uh, as we please. And of course, it's a reduction to cash because the cash payment is there. That's going to be a credit to cash. So again, increasing the office equipment with the debit, decreasing cash with a credit, exchanging one asset for another. Okay. All right, next one. Uh, purchase $45,000 of inventory on account. Again, let's think through that journal entry. We have a debit and a credit. Okay. Okay, we got the debit inventory is very consistently right. And then account, yeah, we're starting to get there. Accounts payable, credit, good. Uh, now, again, in this case, hopefully the inventory is fairly obvious. Um, that's an asset with inventory. You know, there's a, a future uh, economic benefit, um, you know, because I can sell that inventory. It, it has value to me. Um, and then, of course, instead of paying cash, I did it on account. So now I, I have a future economic sacrifice. I eventually have to pay that account. Um, but that future economic sacrifice is a liability. Um, and so we were increasing assets with the inventory. We're increasing liabilities with payable. You know, A equals L plus E. And again, as a reminder, uh, liabilities like accounts payable, they increase with credits. And so that payable is getting larger, that's a credit. Uh, inventory is getting larger, that's a debit. Again, just sort of seeing the system fit together a little bit. Okay. And again, in your notes, I left space where hopefully you're just kind of stacking these journal entries one on top of the other. Um, so they're all kind of in one place there. Uh, purchased $1,800 of supplies using cash. So purchase of supplies using cash. Okay, debit supplies, credit cash. Anybody agree? Okay. Yep, yep exactly. Yep. All right, so again, supplies, future economic benefit. I can use those supplies, you know, pens, pencils, paper, whatever it might be. Uh, so that's a future economic benefit. I do own those supplies, so they are mine. Uh, and of course, you know, the cash is a credit. We're reducing our cash to, to purchase those supplies. But notice there's no, there's no expense with the supplies when I purchase them. The expense comes later as I use the supplies. Again, uh, that'll probably be something we cover on Tuesday. Okay. Oh, and by the way, whenever you see these post-reference numbers, um, eh, it's funny, somebody just asked. Um, so uh, I'm using the same numbers as the book uses wherever I was able to, to figure it out. Um, but 
you know, I'm not going to count off on a test if if you put supplies in and said 135 instead of 125, that's not wrong. Um, it just like like the the student uh, Brianna asked, you know, as long as you're in the hundreds because they're assets, right? Kind of makes sense uh, to have in the hundreds. If you were to say like supplies, you know, 225, well, that would be wrong because 200s are reserved for liability accounts, not asset accounts. Um, but you know, if you had 115 or 135 or 120 or whatever, uh, that's fine. Uh, purchase $1,500 of advertising space uh, using cash uh, that will run social media ads over the next three months. So what's the debit and credit for, um, for this one? And we're purchasing advertising space. Credit to cash, good. What's the other part of that transaction? Anybody know? This one's not in your book, so that was kind of a, a different one. Marketing. So let's kind of get broader. So maybe we don't know the name, you know, pre-purchased advertising, some sort of expense. So did I consume, in other words, did I consume cash without creating some other benefit? Because that's what an expense is, some other future economic benefit. So if there was an advertising expense, it would mean that I consumed the benefit of the advertising already. That I consumed the benefit of the advertising. So someone says prepaid advertising. Yeah, it sounds like a little better. And it is, it's prepaid advertising. Yep, it's prepaid. And the reason that it's prepaid is because the advertising is a future economic benefit. Um, so I haven't really consumed that benefit yet because I haven't run the ads. As the ads run, now you start to consume the advertising and that's when you'd start recording that expense. But when you initially purchase it, uh, you haven't really incurred any expense yet. Of course we will, um, but we just haven't done so yet. And so prepaid advertising is an asset uh, because it does have that future economic benefit element to it. And again, over time, as those advertising ads run, we're gonna consume that prepaid advertising, which means that asset will go away. As that asset gets consumed, then we record the expense. So there will be an advertising expense at some point in the future. It's just not at the initial purchase. So remember with the cruel accounting, it's not when we pay for the advertising, it's when the advertising ads actually run. That's when we record the expense. So as far as when you record the expense, at that point in time, you'd be debiting the expense and crediting prepaid advertising. So we basically, what would happen is we have assets and we have, uh, we have equity. As that asset gets consumed, we record the expense, which reduces equity at the same time. That makes sense, Hunter? Yeah, cool. All right. Does everyone kind of understand? Again, we haven't had an expense yet, but the expense is certainly coming um, as I start running those ads. All right, paid employees, 13,600. Now it's very important here. Uh, it's for the first two weeks of January. So in other words, they've already done the work. So the employees worked and now I'm paying them. Is that salary's expense a debit or a credit? Good. Yep. yep, and then credit cash, good. Now again, this one's a little bit different than the advertising because remember the advertising, the ads are coming in the future, but, this, but with salaries, the work's already been done, right? So I've already consumed that benefit of their work. Um, now, conceptually speaking, you know, if you think about when do you incur a salary's expense for the employees? Well, really, I incur it continuously. I mean, the second that my employee starts working, really, I've started to incur that expense, right? And so whatever benefit that I'm getting from my employees, I'm kind of, I'm kind of consuming that right away. Um, as a practical matter, though, of course, I'm not going to record salary's expense continuously because it would just be ridiculous. And so you do it from time to time. Uh, either 
uh, you know, whenever you have sent out, you know, paychecks is kind of a good time to do it. Um, but the other time you're going to need to think about salaries expense would be at the end of any period. So if we're going to record things or report information at the end of the month, we need to record salaries expense, even if it's not paid. Um, and again, we're going to go through an example of that, not today, but we'll go over an example of that on Tuesday um, of next week. Uh, but anyways, that's the whole idea here. It's a little bit different than the prepaid advertising because, of course, the employees have done the work already. It's not like there's future work that's going to be done. Um, now, of course, if I prepaid my employees for work they're going to do in the future, then you'd have more like an asset. Uh, but in this case, I'm paying them for work they already did, which means that I'm going to have an expense. Does everyone kind of see the distinction between the salaries expense that we're recording here and the prepaid advertising from the previous entry? Does everyone kind of see the difference? It's all about the timing. Okay, I hope everyone does. All right. Um, next one. Sold $5,000 of inventory for $12,500. Uh, the sale was on account. So it was not a cash sale. It was a situation where they bill the client. Um, now, I will say uh, there are actually four accounts that are going to be part of this transaction, not just two. Uh, so there are four accounts. So credit cash would mean that I am uh, paying cash, uh, but cash is not part of this transaction. Uh, but credit inventory is correct. That's right. We are going to credit our inventory. Okay. And if you can put in amounts then uh, that'll be good too. Because there are two different dollar amounts across four different accounts. Okay, yeah. Debit accounts receivable 12,500, good. Credit inventory 5,000, good. Now obviously um, we can't have a debit of 12,500 and a credit for inventory of 5,000 without having something else, right? Because we know that debits always equal credits. There we go. So now we're getting it. So it was revenue. Um, so we got revenue as an account, gain on sale, okay? Now what is revenue supposed to capture, right? Revenue captures not profits. Revenue captures the sale amount. And what was the sale amount? So revenue is a credit. Was the sale only 7,500? Yeah, the sale was 12,500, there we go. So now we got two $12,500 numbers. So where's the other $5,000 debit come from? So we kind of, if you kind of go back up the chat, yeah, there you go, cost of goods sold, right? So this one's a little more complicated. So I'm gonna try to walk through each one first. And so you track the sale and you track the expense related to the sale separately, right? So it's all part of one transaction, but it's really two parts to the same transaction. So let's talk about the sale first. So the, the sale amount was 12,500. That is the economic inflow that we received um, from the sale. Now, of course, that's not cash payment yet. It's a receivable. Uh, but that the receivable is a future economic benefit. We're going to get paid the twelve thousand five hundred at some point, um, but we need to record the sale when the sale takes place. And the sale took took place today on January eighteenth, right? And so we don't we don't wait to record the sale until we collect. We record the sale when the sale is made, and the total value of that sale was twelve thousand five hundred dollars, right? So that's how we record the sale. Sales revenue of 12,500, accounts receivable 12,500. But at the same time, we know there was a cost of that sale. In other words, we had to give up inventory. Um, and so that's why we're reducing our inventory by $5,000 and to record the expense related to the fact that we've now given up inventory. We've made that you know, sacrifice. We've consumed a resource to make this sale. Uh, we call that expense cost of goods sold. So anytime you sell inventory, that expense is called cost of goods sold. So that's just the value of the inventory that we sold. We've now consumed that inventory. We've given it to someone else in order to create that sale. And so that's why we're creating, we're calling it, uh, we, we have recorded the expense uh, of that inventory, cost of goods sold. 
Does everyone kind of see that? Again, revenue is kind of one piece of the transaction and then the cost of the inventory that was sold is the other piece. We call that cost of goods sold. Okay. All right. I paid $3,000 to the supplier. So this is that prior purchase. Uh, and so if we go back to January 5th, uh, here's that purchase. So we purchased inventory on account for $45,000. Uh, now on this date, uh, we're paying uh, $3,000 towards that account. So it would be the debit, what would be the credit for that journey? And so we owed in total 45,000, we paid 3,000. So credit $3,000 accounts payable. So remember, accounts payable is a liability. And so if I credit accounts payable, I'm saying the liability is getting bigger, meaning that I'm somehow owing more. So crediting cash reduces cash, which it seems like that's what happened. So then, rather than crediting payable, what would we do to that payable? Yeah, we're gonna debit the payable, right? Because we're reducing what we owe by making a payment. There we go. Yeah, so we're gonna debit our accounts payable by 3,000 and credit cash 3,000. So again, if we have our asset equals liability, our asset is going down 3,000 through the cash payment, but at the same time, our payable is going down 3,000 as well. Okay. All right, another more involved one. Now, in this case, we made another sale. Uh, in this case, it was a cash sale, though. So instead of having an accounts receivable, uh, we have a cash sale. So there are four accounts again, uh, two debits and two credits. Hopefully, we can get there a little faster this time. So what are the debits and what are the credits for this sale? Cash good. Now, is that cost of goods sold for twenty-two thousand? Is that a debit or a credit? Remember, what kind of account is cost of goods sold? That's an expense, right? So, credit is a revenue. Yeah, revenue is a credit. Yeah. Credit inventory, yep, we're reducing our inventory, right? Because we're, we're consuming that inventory. There we go. Yeah, we're going to debit cost of goods sold. Yep, there we go. Yep. So kind of a similar tale as last time. We record the sale, which is sales revenue. That's the economic value that's been added to the company from the sale. Um, 48,400, of course, in this case, it's the form of cash. And so we're going to debit our cash. But again, that sale was not free. Uh, there was a cost to producing that sale. We had to consume some inventory. And so we're reducing our inventory account by 22,000 to reflect the fact that inventory has now you know, left our company in the form of a sale. Um, and the expense related to that inventory then is what we call cost of goods sold. Again, it's double entry accounting, right? So if I'm going to take inventory off my books, there needs to be somewhere else uh, that we record something. Uh, and again, because we're just consuming that inventory in order to create the sale, uh, that is an expense. And we call the inventory related expense cost of goods sold. Again, thinking every time, every time there's a transaction, whatever amount there is, there's two sides. There's always double entry. So there's two sides to every transaction. Okay. All right. So I had made that credit sale before. Now I'm collecting on a portion of it. So I got a payment from Knight's company for $7,500. So what would I record there? Debit or cash? Yep, because we're receiving cash. 
credit. Yep, there we go. Yep, crediting that AR. Yep. So the cash that we receive is a debit, $7,500. We're reducing the receivable. Uh, that's a credit for $7,500. So again, um, we have a, a debit and a credit. Our asset doesn't change, right? So the total asset remains constant because we're just exchanging one asset for a different asset. We already recorded the revenue related to this. So of course, there's no additional revenue from the collection. Okay. Uh, made another payment to its supplier. Uh, the nice thing is we just did one of these journal entries, not, not too many entries ago where we made that payment before. So hopefully this one's not too bad. What's the debit and the credit when we make a payment uh, to somebody who, uh, you know, who, a, a supplier who allowed me to owe them? Again, that account payable that was created before, now we're making a payment on it. Yeah, we're gonna credit cash, good. And then we're gonna debit the payable. Yep, we're reducing that liability. Yep, good. So we're going to debit accounts payable 5,000 and we're going to credit our cash 5,000 again. So we have assets going down 5,000 and the payable going down 5,000. So A still equals L plus E. And again, the debit credit system is what allows this to work within this framework, right? So the fact that, you know, the payable decreases with the debit and the asset cash decreases with the credit allows the accounting equation to be in balance and also allows debits to continue to equal credits. Again, it's just a system that we use in order to communicate these, these economics. All right, last one. Uh, paid $600 in cash dividends to its shareholders. So $600 in cash dividends. It's a new account. Thinking about that picture. Yep, there we go. Debit dividends, credit cash. Dividends, debit, good. Yep. Yep, exactly. So we know that dividends increase with a debit, just like expenses and assets increase with a debit. And so that debit amount is $600. So we're increasing our dividends. And of course, we're reducing our cash. And so remember, if you think about the dividends is an equity account, it's like a, con they call it a contra equity account. That's just a term we use to mean that it behaves in the opposite direction. So like a normal equity account increases with credits, but a dividend increases with debits. Uh, but the reality is, if you kind of still think about that picture, the A equals L plus E, as cash goes out the door, we're reducing our assets by $600. But at the same time, the dividend decreases my equity. By six hundred dollars, and so we still have A equals L plus E. Debits still equal credits. Uh, the framework uh, still works. Okay, but again, that's just a sampling of you know some journal entries. The book has some different journal entries. Uh, the homework obviously is going to have different journal entries. Um, you know, you're going to have a an Excel based project. It's going to have different journal entries. And then finally, of course, um, you know, there's, I'm gonna, once I, you know, probably next week at some point, I'll have some, some extra uh, review questions uh, that, you know, we'll have some different ones as well. So plenty to practice. And the homework has, has more as well. I think I may have already said homework though. Okay. But essentially that takes us through the third step in the um, accounting process. And so again, that first step is, you know, source documents, identifying economic transactions. The second step is analyzing those transactions. And this was the third step, uh, creating journal entries for those transactions. So step four then is taking that journal entry information and now getting into our general ledger accounts. And so our, our ledger, uh, the recording of the, the, you know, the journal entry recordings, um, you know, that's sort of one step and sort of, I would argue that's kind of simultaneous to it. We're going to treat it as two distinct steps, but kind of it's really typically happening simultaneously. Every time you do a journal entry, your general ledger account is being updated. Um, and so again, uh, after you do this, that's when we're going to post. Now, again, in, a, in the real world, the accounting system is kind of 
simultaneously posting. Uh, but for our purposes, we're going to kind of do it in two different steps. So we have the journal entry, and then we have posting as a separate step. Um, uh, just for our purposes. And again, we're going to use the T account framework to illustrate this, uh, but understand within the accounting system, you know, this is all kind of happening behind the scenes. So it's not, it's not like there's T accounts sitting somewhere in some computer system. Um, it's really accumulating these uh, journal entries into the permanent account balances or the account balances for the period. Now um, on your, uh, if you kind of look at your uh, your lecture guide, I tried to leave you space with T accounts and um, labels so that with each one of these journal entries, there's room for you to post it to the T account. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna fast forward through these slides real quick to show you where we're gonna end up so that you can just see the picture of where we're going uh, so that you kind of record these correctly and don't get off on the right track on the wrong track. Um, but at the end of the day, once you record all of these. Uh, into your T accounts, you're going to see something looks like this. And so what you're what we're doing is within the cash T account, after we record all of these, you're going to see several entries within the cash account. So this is kind of where we're going. So by the end of posting all of these journal entries, this is what your cash T account should roughly look like. Right? Obviously, far fewer entries for prepaid advertising or accounts receivable or inventory, but this is sort of where we're going to end up, all right? Um, but on within each of these, we're only doing one at a time, right? So it's, it's the, there, you are going to be accumulating them in your T accounts, um, but I am obviously not, um, I don't have room to do that on here. And so I'm just doing kind of one at a time. And so this first journal entry was the first one that we did. Um, you know, we, we debited our cash 150,000, we credited our common stock 150,000. And the thing to remember with the T accounts, it's actually very, very simple. If your journal entry is right, then the only thing you really worry about is you have the cash as the account label. So you have the account label in the middle of the T, and then you have the post reference number, usually off to the right. So cash, the reference is 100. For common stock, the reference is 300. And after that, it's pretty straightforward. Debits on the left, credits on the right. Debits on the left, credits on the right. Kind of that truth we talked about last time. And that doesn't change here. And so in this case, you know, the debit is to cash. So on 1-1, one, one, on January 1st, and we're talking about the, the general journal, page one, uh, we have a debit to cash for 150000 For that same entry, uh, again, on January 1st in the general uh, journal, page one, we're crediting common stock for 150000 So you can see here that we have a debit on the left for cash, a credit on the right for common stock. So this is just our way. Again, we're illustrating this using T accounts. In reality, you know, some accounting system would be tracking within this cash account. Okay, now we have a debit to the cash account, and we kind of hold it there. And then we're just going to wait for the next one, the next one, the next one. We're just going to keep updating. Okay. All right, next one. So again, we have the, the cash and the notes payable. Again, we have our cash account with the post reference 100. We have our note payable with the post reference 220. Again, debits on the left. Credits on the right, debits on the left, credits on the right. And again, this is just a system for allowing us to capture and then communicate the economics of the company. And so we're going to now capture this journal entry into our T account. Uh, again, putting the credit, uh, so, sorry, putting the debit on the left under the cash account, putting the credit on the right underneath the notes payable account. All right, prepaid rent. Again, prepaid rent, we have the post reference. Both of these are asset accounts. And by the way, in, in your notes, I have the asset accounts, or sorry, the, um, well, I do it like asset accounts first, then liabilities, then permanent equity. And then I have the income statement, T accounts in a separate section, and then dividends below that. So if you have trouble locating one, that's just, just the general order. 
And so um, hopefully you can find it without too much difficulty. But again, with prepaid rent, we have the debit on the left. With the cash, we have the credit on the right. We're just tracking debits and credits. And if I'm moving too fast, uh, just let me know. Again, the office equipment, another journal entry. It is an asset. And we already kind of talked about that. Debits on the left, credits on the right. And we're just kind of tracking everything within the debit credit framework inside of our key accounts. Okay. Same thing. Of course, we're debiting our inventory. We're crediting our account payable. We've already recorded this. So now we're just rolling it into our T accounts. And the only difference really here is, you know, January 5th instead of January 1st. So, you know, with the J GJ, uh, you know, general uh, journal, page one, I'm, you know, uh, some companies would have multiple pages. So this just gives you a little more reference to where to look for it. Um, you know, so what's happening is, you know, within this computer system, if there were to be a particular, a particular amount where you're questioning it, uh, you usually what what the reference allows you to do is to go back into your into your general ledger, your general journal, and find where the actual entry was in case you needed to. So like in QuickBooks, um, you can look at any amount, and if you highlight it, uh, usually it'll take you to the actual entry amount, uh, just allowing you to track it down. Okay, uh, purchased $1,800 of supplies. Again, debits on the left, uh, credits on the right. Okay, same thing here, prepaid advertising. Uh, debits on the left, credits on the right again. And I'm trying not to move too fast, uh, but I also know that, you know, it shouldn't be too hard to copy most of the same. Ah, thank you. Finally, someone said slow down. Because <laughs> you, you know, like when you're looking, like, am I going too fast? Am I going too slow? I go, I'll go back one just to kind of make sure everyone's caught up. So again, the supplies account, uh, 125 is the reference number. It's an asset. You're going to debit that one on the left, credit cash on the right. With prepaid advertising, both of these, again, are asset accounts. Uh, you can see that from the post reference. So they should be relatively close to each other. Again, the prepaid advertising is a debit on the left, of course. And with the cash, it's a credit on the right hand side. So again, by now, that cash account should be getting fuller and fuller. because you know, There's lots of entry amounts inside that cash T account. Uh, GJ1 is general journal page one. It's just a reference. And so I'm just, I try to be consistent with the book. And basically it's saying, listen, you know, you might have, you know, 10 pages of your general journal. Uh, and if you're trying to find the reference, you should have the page reference down. Now you're never going to have more than one page. Um, but it's just telling you that there is a way to kind of track to say, okay, this is the date and this is the page where you can find. Uh, the underlying journal entry related to this amount. Again, in your accounting system, there isn't going to be a T account, but there would be something to indicate where that amount came from inside of your accounting system. And so if you ever use like QuickBooks or anything like that, you can look at an account and you can see all the journal entries that affected that account. You can highlight one and it'll show you exactly what that journal entry was, when it was recorded, and what was on the other side of that transaction. Um, so on an exam, are you going to list all the possible T accounts? Are we going to make your own? So you're not going to have to make your own. I try to be efficient. There'll be kind of an outline of it. And then you got to figure out how to use, you know, just apply it. Okay. All right, next one. So now I have the salaries expense. Now a little different here. Uh, because the salaries expense is an income statement uh, account. 
And so it's not up top where the balance sheet is, it's actually further down. Uh, so if you have a little difficulty locating it, um, it's, it's down in the income statement section of the list of T accounts. But again, same idea, you know, debits are gonna be on the left with the salaries expense and credits are gonna be on the right. Uh, that framework doesn't change. It doesn't matter what type of account it is. If it's a debit, it goes in the left-hand column. If it's a credit, it goes in the right-hand column. But again, that salaries expense is, is further down underneath the income statement. Okay. All right. Next one. Again, this one was a little more involved, right? So we had four different accounts. You can see there were two accounts that are debited, two accounts that are credited. Again, it doesn't matter what type of account. Debits are always on the left and credits are always on the right. So we're just mapping the journal entry information into the T account. And you can see um, that uh, two of the accounts are assets, the accounts receivable and the inventory. And one of the accounts is a revenue account. And one of the accounts is an expense account. And so again, it might take you a, a minute to find them. Uh, but again, everything's kind of listed there. And you can uh, hopefully now kind of see where to put everything. Uh, again, the accounts receivable is a debit for 12500 It's in the left-hand column. And the cost of goods sold is also a debit. And it's in the left-hand column. And then sales revenue and inventory are both credits. And so those entry amounts are both in the right-hand column. Okay, debits on the left, credits on the right. Doesn't matter what kind of account it is. Debits are always on the left, credits are always on the right. Again, we're just trying to map things out. Again, the ultimate goal, again, we're trying to communicate the economics. And this is the system that allows everything to come together. Okay. Next one. Again, we're making a payment on that payable. Debits on the left, credits on the right. That part hasn't changed. So again, January 20th from the general journal. $3,000 debit to accounts payable. And then similarly, a $3,000 credit to cash. Again, posting that journal entry to our T account framework. Okay. Another big one. So four different accounts, two debits, two credits. Hopefully it's not too bad because we've seen a very similar one. Again, we're, we're taking that the general uh, journal information and we are posting it to our T accounts. And again, debits are on the left, credits on the right. So we're gonna be debiting our cash for 48,400. Also debiting our cost of goods sold for 22,000. And then finally crediting sales revenue and inventory. Again, we're just mapping that journal entry to the T account. Okay, just a couple more. All right, so then again, similarly, uh, we are debiting our cash for 7,500. Uh, crediting our accounts receivable. Again, both of these are assets. So they're kind of near the top. Debiting our cash, crediting our accounts receivable. And we're just mapping every single journal entry into our T accounts. No, knowing again that this is sort of in, in practice, this, these things are simultaneously happening. You know, as soon as you post something to the journal, um, you're updating your account, your T account uh, behind the scenes. All 
I paid that supplier. Again, with the accounts payable, that's the debit. Cash is the credit from January 28th for $5,000 each. And the accounts payable is a liability account. Cash is an asset, both are balance sheet items, uh, but they are slightly different sections of that balance sheet. Okay, final one. Now the dividends is all the way at the bottom. Uh, so it's a, you know, all the way separated out at the very bottom. And so that dividend account is gonna be debited $600. And of course the credit is the cash for $600. All right. So again, now we would have posted everything to our T accounts, All right? So now if you kind of think about our accounting process, the first four steps are all dealing with these external transactions. And so we have the you know, source documents, think about those economic transactions, analyzing those transactions, uh, doing journal entries for those transactions and posting the journal entry information to our general ledger accounts. And so all four of those things have been happening behind the scenes, um, you know, in our accounting system. And so um, that takes us all the way through all those external transactions. And now we're ready to kind of move into the next phase of the accounting process. And that next phase, it really starts with getting what's called an unadjusted trial balance. That's the fifth step in our accounting process. And, and really what an adjusted trial balance is, it's just the collection of all the amounts posted to the general ledger. It's just a collection of that. And so again, we, we use the T-account framework to kind of show it. Um, and so hopefully you kind of can see, you know, how that all kind of collects within each account. Uh, the accounting system itself, uh, you know, it takes on different forms and looks a little bit differently. Um, but essentially that same thing is happening behind the scenes in any accounting system. And so it culminates, all that activity culminates into an unadjusted trial balance. And so again, let, before we report what that looks like, let's look at our T accounts, because I want to make sure that you have everything kind of up to date uh, and you didn't miss anything. And so of course, here's that cash account. Um, you know, we had four different debits, uh, each of them on the left-hand side, of course. And then we had eight different credits, uh, each one on the right-hand side. And then the way the T account works, which is really what the system is doing behind the scenes, is it's accumulating all of this activity and it's giving you a balance, an unadjusted trial balance at the end of the month. And so for January 31st, that unadjusted trial balance in the cash account is $172,400. Again, that reflects all the debits less all the credits, giving you a net debit account. The same is true for prepaid advertising. In this case, there was only one journal entry. And so our, our debit of 1500 uh, results in a debit balance of 1500 because there's no other activity. And then the additional uh, asset accounts are right here. You can see with the accounts receivable, there were two different activities. Again, the initial sale, creating a receivable of 12,500, the payment on that receivable of 7,500, which means there's still a net receivable left of 5,000. So that's the balance in the account. It's a $5,000 debit balance. All of these are asset accounts. And so all of them have debit balances. And so the inventory, similarly, we acquired some inventory for 45,000. We sold some of the inventory uh, for 5,000 and then additional 22,000 which means we have an $18,000 balance in our inventory account. So again, notice you have the date, the general journal, and then the amount for that entry. Supplies, we purchase supplies, nothing else has gone on. Same thing with office equipment and prepaid rent. So those are a little bit easier because there's really only one thing that happened.
It's just the purchase. All right, has everyone got all the information on those C-counts? Were you, were you accurate? Pretty close, hopefully. All right. Now here it looks a little bit different. And the reason that it looks a little bit different is because we've flipped from assets to liabilities and then permanent equity accounts. And so notice that with the uh, liabilities, each of them has a credit balance, which is exactly what we would expect. You know, much like assets, expenses, and dividends have debit balances, um, the liabilities, permanent equity accounts, and revenue have credit balances. Now, with retained earnings, we have a, a zero balance on the debit side. Of course, that would, you could just easily have a zero balance on the credit side. I just put it on the debit side because that's what the book did. And so I just want to be consistent with the book. Uh, in all honesty, I probably would have had a credit balance of zero, but I mean, that really doesn't matter. It's just a zero balance. But you can see with the payable, you initially had a payable of 45,000. That was that credit. We'd made some payments on that payable, which is why there's still only $37,000 left that we still owe. And so again, we're just mapping things into this account. You can see then we can conclude that we owe $37,000 to our supplier as of the end of January. And of course, we do still have that note payable at the end of January, common stock that had been issued, which is that contributed capital from our owners. Um, you know, very rarely do you have, a, you don't really have a lot of entries to common stock. It's a, you know, very few and far between. So that's kind of normal. And we haven't done anything with retained earnings yet. So it's still sitting there at zero. Okay. All right, so now this one's a little more, uh, a, a little more, uh, a lot of things going on here, I guess. Uh, but on the income statement, remember, revenue is a credit, you know, it's normally a credit balance. It increases with credits, which is why we have, for every one of these sales, we have credit entries and a credit balance. So the accumulated sales revenue for the month of January was $60,900. That's from two different sales. But of course, with cost of goods sold and salaries expense, those are both expenses. And so they're gonna have debit balances. And so again, there were two different transactions that dealt with cost of goods sold. So in total for the month of January, our total cost of goods sold was 27,000. Again, this is uh, an unadjusted trial balance. And then similarly, there's only one journal entry to date that dealt with salaries expense. And so then our unadjusted trial balance is $13,600 from that one entry. But hopefully you've got all those caught up. And then finally, dividends. Hopefully it's not too bad. There's only one journal entry. So one thing to post, which means its balance is the $600 debit balance. Okay, everybody tracking? Okay. All right, so now what do we do? So we have all that information. It's being captured in our T account for illustrative purposes. It's being captured in our, in our accounting system um, within the, each of these accounts. And then you need to present your unadjusted trial balance, all right? So we're illustrating it using our T accounts, but it's also in reality being collected within the company's accounting system. So the output of the accumulation of all these activities that's the unadjusted trial balance. So there's going to be some sort of output that accumulates all these activities. So whenever we present the balances, they are presented in a specific order. And that order roughly follows that post-reference numbering system. So we do the assets, the hundreds first. We do the liabilities, the 200s second. The permanent equity accounts, the 300s third. Revenue, which is the 400s fourth expenses, which are the 500s fifth, and then finally dividends, which is the 600s is last. So this is the order that we present them. We do not present them all debit balances first or all credit balances first. We do it in order of that reference system. So hundreds, then 200s, then 300s, then 400s, and 500s and 600s. Now in your, uh, in your notes, I left space with a label for the unadjusted trial balance. And I tried to leave you space 
to write everything in, all right? So again, we're gonna list the assets first and we're just simply pulling that unadjusted child balance from the T account and we're putting it into this table for presentation. Again, we're presenting the unadjusted trial balance. And we're just listing the assets first. Obviously, I just don't have enough room to list everything on one sheet. And so I'm just doing the assets first. And then on the next sheet, I'm going to do the rest of it. Uh, but just understand in your notes, you know, you'd list all those assets first, and then you'd list the liabilities, equity, everything else right underneath it. It all just kind of be right together. And if you look at the book, the book illustrates that pretty well. But again, we're just pulling those balances right from our T accounts. So again, we have uh, seven different uh, asset accounts. And then the remainder of the accounts, uh, we have our, our two liability accounts, accounts payable and notes payable. Of course, they have credit balances. Uh, we have our permanent uh, equity accounts, common stock and retained earnings. Uh, both of those are reported with credit balances. Uh, of course, retained earnings has a zero balance, but um, and then, of course, now we move into our income statement items. So the 400s first, which is sales revenue, that has a credit balance. And then our expenses, cost of goods sold and salaries expense uh, for a total of whatever that is, 40,600. And then, of course, our dividends is last but not least. That's a 600 series. And so that gets listed last. Then so we add up all the debits. If you include the assets, the total amount of debits would be 277,900. And it must be the case that the credits total the same amount, uh, $277,900. Uh, they, would, they, would, they need to equal out. And so if they did it, of course, that would be a problem. Because debits always need to equal credits. So really, we're kind of in that second phase now of the process. And now we've accumulated we have our unadjusted trial balance, uh, and that concludes step five, is getting to that unadjusted trial balance and making sure everything balances. Now for step six, and we're not gonna go into actually executing the journal entries, we're just gonna talk conceptually about what they are. Um, so now we have that unadjusted trial balance. The next step, step six, is now to create the adjusting entries. And so what's the purpose behind these adjusting entries? Basically, it's our application of accrual accounting. Um, so uh, essentially, you know, what we've done up to this point is every transaction, there's been some sort of external component, some sort of external prompting for the journal entry. But the fact is there is economic reality, economic updates or economic activities where there really isn't an external transaction or cash flow that kind of prompts the journal entry, but yet there's still economics that are happening that we need to reflect and we need to record. And so the adjusting entries are that step where we think a little more thoroughly about the economics of our company and start to record some additional things where there's not an external transaction or cash flow to prompt the journal entry. So what are those three things? What are those three things that, are, that we need to focus on in this step? Does anybody know uh, in any one or, or two of the three types of adjusting entries uh, that we need to capture here? So what do you mean by revenue? We have already recorded revenue, right? Because we made sales, we recorded revenue. I'm not saying there isn't any revenue, but we need to be a little more specific. Prepaid stuff after this month. Yep, for sure. Yep, remember we talked about we have prepaid advertising, prepaid rent, supplies, but as we consume those things, that's when we start recording expenses. Well, guess what? Time has passed. We've consumed some of those things, right? And so that prepayments uh, or deferrals, you know, those for sure, that's definitely one type. There's another type. In addition to prepayments or deferrals, there we go. Yep. 
Accruals is the other one. You know, so basically, you know, before what had happened, like for salaries, um, you know, our, our employees worked for a couple of weeks, we paid them, we record the salaries expense. Well, guess what's happened since January 15th? My employees kept working, right? But I, did I record anything? Do you remember recording a second salaries expense yet? No, we didn't do that, but yet my employees worked. And so I need to record that. That's called an accrual, a situation where I accrue an expense. And then finally, there are estimates, um, but uh, we're not gonna spend a lot of time in estimates because they're kind of inherent in the other two. But again, prepayments or deferrals are one type of adjusting entry. Accruals is the second type of main adjusting entry. And then estimates are used uh, within the context of both of those and can be used separately as well. All right, prepayments or deferrals. Again, we're gonna talk in concept. We are not gonna do any journal entries today. So a prepayment occurs when a cash flow precedes either an expense or the recognition of revenue. So cash first, then the economic consequence, the expense or the revenue comes second. And that order is really important. So supplies expense is something we touched on a little bit, but I'm gonna highlight it here again. So when I buy the supplies, I don't expense them immediately. Well, when do I expense them? I expense them as I use them, right? And so you notice the cash flow came first, it created an asset. And then as we consume that asset, we record the expense. With the unearned revenue, uh, that's something like, um, you know, subscriptions or something like that. So if I'm a magazine provider and someone pays me for a subscription, they pay me today. Uh, so the cash comes now, uh, but I don't get to record any revenue because I haven't supplied any subscriptions. But as soon as I start supplying subscriptions to the to my clients, now I can start recording that revenue. So again, prepayments are when the cash flow comes first, and then the expense or the revenue comes later. Those are prepayments, otherwise known as deferrals. So let's talk a little more about prepaid expenses. We touched on this. But again, conceptually, a prepaid expense creates a future economic benefit. That's an asset. The use of supplies, the use of office space, the use of equipment, the use of advertising. All of those have a future economic benefit. So there's initially some sort of asset created when I acquire the prepaid item, when I pay for the prepaid item. So over time, that future economic benefit is consumed. So I start using my advertising, I start using my supplies, I start using my equipment. So as it's consumed, the asset expires and I record the expense. So that's kind of the idea of a prepaid expense. Pay now, consume it later, and as I consume it, that's when the expense gets recorded. So as I consume those supplies, I record supplies expense. As I start using the office equipment, I'll record the equipment expense whatever it might be, we call it depreciation, but you know, we'll get to those details next time. But again, that's the idea, that's the order. Similarly, similar, similarly with deferred revenue, again, conceptually in this case, a deferred revenue creates a future economic sacrifice. So there's a liability, right? a future economic sacrifice. You know, if I get paid for a magazine subscription today, well, I guess what? I gotta supply those magazines. So there's a future sacrifice that I'm gonna to have to make, uh, and that is a liability. As that sacrifice is actually made, then that liability starts to expire, and that's when I get to record the revenue. So you can see with prepaid expenses, I create an asset, then consume the asset. As I consume the asset, I record the expense. With deferred revenue, I create a liability, and then as I sort of make the sacrifice related to that liability, the liability expires and I record the revenue. So this is kind of generally how these prepayments or deferrals work. Prepaid expense means you get an asset, then an expense later on. Deferred revenue, you have a liability, and then revenue later on. Again, this is accrual accounting, trying to capture the fact that there's no external mechanism for creating these journal entries, but there's an internal re reality where the economics of our situation needs to be updated. I've consumed some rent. I've consumed some supplies. I've used up some equipment. 
all those things that I need to record. Okay, so we're not gonna do journal entries. Uh, we're gonna pick up these journal entries on Tuesday, hopefully in class. Uh, again, I'll, I'll be sending out some emails about what we're gonna do in class on that first day, uh, but I do hope to do some introductions uh, and some things, you know, get to know some faces and some names. Uh, hopefully we get a chance to do that on Tuesday. Um, but we're going to kind of stop here for now. Uh, or does anyone have any questions or uh, comments or anything like that before we close up shop for the day? Okay. Well, I'm going to stop recording.